Hello. Today's episode is a conversation with Dr. Rich Frazee, who is a composer who I met at UW-Madison when I was working on my bachelor's and he was working on his DMA. In our conversation, we get into a lot of cool areas, including academic canons, what it's like to be a composer working in the modern world, in academic worlds, in church services, and even in the worlds of rock and heavy metal. But before we get to that, please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. And if you would like to consider supporting my content generally, please visit my Patreon page. Welcome to Music in Mind. Music in Mind. With Anthony Call. Everybody. I'm here with Dr. Rich Frazee, who uh, works with online education at UW-Madison. That's the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, Rich and I met each other uh, at UW when he was working on his DMA and I was working on my bachelor's. And uh, I finished up uh, December of 2013 and Rich finished up his DMA in 2016, you said? Yes. Yep. Cool. So uh, that that's a while ago now. So what <laughs> what have you been up to since since the yeah, UW no, days? Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, for a while, both while I was at UW and for quite a few years after that, um, I got into church music. Ah. So um, my what I basically everything involved with the worship service at at um, the the campus ministry in Madison where I was at Wisconsin Lutheran Chapel and Student Center. So I'd be recruiting musicians. I'd be picking the songs. I'd be recruiting the AV personnel. Okay. Um, wow. If if I thought that bass guitar would be really helpful for the service, <laughs> I'd slap down. You know, get get the bass going. Um, if I needed to like conduct an ensemble, then I'd do some conducting. Mm -hmm. um, if I if no one else was available to run the soundboard, that's what I did. Right. Um, so I got to wear just a ton of different hats and one of my favorite parts about it as a composer was there'd be so many services where there's like a saxophone uh, available for a service and we didn't have a sax like like an official mm. like sax part to do a hymn or a song or whatever so i'd just write the sax parts oh, nice. for whoever was available Great. so that, that was a blast that got me into uh, the world of um d um media creation so mm -hmm. got to do a lot with um editing videos creating music work with digital audio workstations just with whatever video projects we needed to get done mm -hmm. uh, along the line i got into um, online teaching at uw madison while i was um, finishing up uh, my, my dissertation i started teaching uh, through the UW, uw's independent learning program mm -hmm. so these are completely asynchronous online courses students can enroll at any time mm -hmm. um, students can be submitting work at any time and so i got to geek out with students on like the history of jazz nice. um legendary performers is a course on like early 20th century pop music mm. um diving into uh the whole music history with a appreciation history of music mm -hmm. um which was just Again, just I love, love, love online music education. I think it's yeah. wonderful stuff. Um, and then that opened the door for me to take on, you know, more and more responsibilities with UW and online teaching. And then March 2020 hit. Right. Um, you know, the whole world was kind of shutting down and everybody was sheltering in place. And then it was basically at, at UW-Madison, it was all hands on deck. Like, Rich, right. you've taught an online course before. <laughs> Please help these people work with <laughs> knowing how an online course works. Nice. And so basically we just dropped anything that wasn't pressing. Right. And that's what I've been doing since. So um, starting July 1st, I'll be part of uh, the new Center of Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring at um, UW-Madison. Excited okay. to be a part of that and helping faculty just work with pedagogy and online teaching and anything they need help with. But at the same point, no matter what I'm working on, I love finding excuses to write music. Like, hey, you're working on like, a, you know, some sort of video tutorial. Can I write some cheesy background music for you? Like, yeah, Rich, I love some cheesy background <laughs> nice. music. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I feel like it's a very, it's a very, um, it's common for modern composers to, yes. to have one foot or several feet in uh, the tech world. Uh, outside of just their their artistic practice, I feel like mm -hmm. we're we're all recording engineers and video editors and everything now. Yeah, 
Well, um, just to go a little bit of a tangent, I, I remember, so one of my goals back when I was an undergrad, I wanted to get into video game music. Uh-huh. And I, I got an internship at uh, Guild Software in okay. uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Cool. They make a wonderful space video game called Vendetta Online. Um, and my thought was like, oh, well, I'll at some point, you know, I'll, I'll work on my music and, you know, the, these companies, they have all the big fancy producer stuff. At some point, I'll just kind of head in the office and, you know, check out their studio or whatever. And it's like, no, Rich, like you are responsible for like not just writing the music but getting the sounds mm-hmm, right. and the mastering and etc 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 and that was just a pretty eye-opening thing and you know the, the more hats we wear the more gigs we are you yep. know we oh, can yeah. take on mm-hmm. yeah because you mentioned you were doing live sound at the church even yep. uh, mm-hmm. as well yeah, as yeah. arranging and were you playing yep. also yeah wow. which again is um it's a lot of fun just um I, the the service that i'm most proud of um it was as things were starting to open up um i I was still helping a little bit with uh, after um sheltering in place was ending Mm -hmm. and just like okay well we have these people helping out we are spreading out the mics and we are keeping things socially distanced and nobody sharing a microphone by any stretch of the imagination and yet again it's just it's it's an interesting balancing work how can i make a cool sound how can i make sure i don't like blow up the speakers with feedback that might be coming from some different <laughs> instruments so yeah and what what kind of music is it at the church at that church um it is every i mean it okay. is very diverse um it's a it's a it's a lutheran church um mm-hmm. and so again we we love our old german hymns um nice. we, we we love us some bach um at the same point um so, so there would be times where Oh, part, these, these were some of my favorite services. And again, this is just what you can do with being being creative as, as a composer, mm-hmm. where I would just gather all the strings, winds, brass players that we could, and we just made our own, like, ad hoc orchestra. That sounds um, amazing. But, but, yeah, it was just just a blast. Um, for a lot of these, uh, the people who attend, they would be active in, like, their high school band or their mm-hmm. high school orchestra. Right. They would go to college. They wouldn't have the outlet anymore. Like, it, it wasn't, like, built right. into their daily schedule. Yeah. So I would recruit them, like, hey, you can... If you can play violin with the church, that'd be awesome. Cool. Uh, but again, going back to, you know, we d- wouldn't exactly have, you know, orchestral scores and parts for some old hymn based on four violins, three saxophones, yeah, right. and a trombone. Mm-hmm. And so I just get to it's fun. You know, create some music for Bust them. out your orchestration skills. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, which, again, was a lot of fun. We're like, oh, so this, this time we're going to have like seven flutes and a cello. Uh-huh. Let's let's see how we can be creative with with orchestration to actually make this work. Yeah. But uh, there are also um, uh, like uh, contemporary praise bands that would uh, that would play on a regular basis with right. with the church music. Um, we'd have a choir, a wonderful choir director who was. I mean, would do everything from spirituals to um, kind of like jazzy stuff to, you know, Bach and mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very musically eclectic. Um, yeah. And again, as as someone who loves playing playing electric bass, anytime that I need to play bass, I mean, when when do you not need, or when, when can you not benefit from, from oh, some yeah. extra bass lines? What would you do with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I've recently um, been subbing at a Lutheran church uh, yeah. just on guitar, but it's it's a uh, it's kind of like I guess CCM you might call it, yep. like contemporary yeah. it, Christian it's contemporary sort of rock. Music. It, you know, the, all the guitar mm-hmm. lines are sort of like U two, like these washy big. Yep. Big sounds. It, and it's interesting with, with Lutheran churches specifically, because they have such a long history uh, with a really rich history of music that has shifted a lot. Mm-hmm. And it seems like the, the church you're working at really uh, engages both with the history and brings the modern in. in yeah. In an interesting yeah. way. Yeah. And um, just to name drop, for anybody who's interested in such things, there's a, a musical group. They, they weren't part of this church, but um, I'm familiar with them. They're called Koine, K-O-I-N-E. Um, just like a Lutheran band. And they'll take like these old centuries old like hymns and make it mm. sound like Ben Folds or something uh, <laughs> oh, more, nice. more contemporary. So it's, again, using that rich history, mm-hmm. but making it sound you know re- recognizing that we are in the 21st century right yeah yeah so how do you how do you feel about that as as a composer generally this this is kind of ties a little bit back to our education at uw madison because i remember when i was there i was a little frustrated with um how maybe um how there was sort of a lack of focus on 
the 21st century in terms of technology with uh, some of the some of the education, not all of it. I mean, the I would say the the classical education at UW was amazing, and I yeah. like what I learned from Brian Heyer and from Steve Dembski and Laura Schwenninger and Leslie Blasius and all these people. I, I still yeah. I've taken with these these really important lessons. But there was this gap in the how, how to bridge it and bring it into the 21st century with technology, with how to get performances, oh, with yeah. how to engage with a musical culture. That's so tough. Um, yeah. <laughs> and part of that is just <laughs> so th this is a kind of um, I mean, there's a lot, yep. a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of different roles, you know, and something to consider and I, I think this is just great for, for institutions to consider, mm -hmm. for people going to music school to consider. First off, what is the role of, of your education? Like, what are you trying to get from it? Yep. Um, what is it that you're trying to teach your students? Like, what is the primary goal? Is, is it to be um, scholars of, of music theory, music history, music composition, et cetera, et cetera? Is it um, to dive into the world of technology? And right. I think... I think it was just shortly after, and I'm going to butcher the name, but there was a new center or new lab or something mm -hmm. about electronic music that mm -hmm. I did that I that was started at UW Madison. I, apologies that I don't have the specifics off the top of my head, um, but and again, that that ties into to the electronic world. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at the avant-garde? Are we looking right. at the commercial, yep. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, are we looking to bridge the gap to popular music? Is well, how do we want to approach popular music in our academic curriculum, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and my overly broad, and I, I'm going to say my, my safe answer. Uh -huh. I, I like playing it safe. I I I I, I wear that on my sleeve. Uh -huh. Is that you know that that's just something that institutions just need to determine what their right. what their priorities course, are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing you, you mentioned getting performances. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I love about the experience that we had at UW Madison mm -hmm. was we'd have our recitals um, oh, yeah. with a composition studio um, studio, and it was on us. Uh, we got to mm -hmm. have that practical experience about recruiting musicians and getting the logistics about what this is going to look like for the recital. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, well, very cool, just a little bit of an advertisement for uh, the DMA composition program at UW Madison. Part of the degree program is you put on two lecture recitals. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was the most complex part of my degree because uh -huh. you're recruiting musicians right. and you're finding a space mm -hmm. for your recital. And you, you're you putting this piece together and you're promoting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to that, you also, so you're putting on the promoter hat. You're putting on the music director hat of you're getting this performance going. You're also putting on the scholar hat of, um, like, a, if it's a lecture recital, like, well, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, I, that's something that's wonderful to consider. Um, one thing that I, I think has the potential to um, to be developed. Um, Adam, are you, are you familiar with Adam Neely? Oh, of course. Me, yeah. Oh yeah, from, He's great. I love mm -hmm. love love Adam. He he had a a powerful powerful um, longer video last summer mm -hmm. um, about music and just the issue of race like how oh, is his, race his, his and his history music, music and white supremacy video yeah yeah hmm. um and you know something that and again there there are big complex things like right i mean we could spend like a few days just kind of going on to all those different uh things mm -hmm. that are brought up oh yeah one of them that adam neely brings up is what's being just the music theory curriculum right um so when I so my, I did my undergrad at Wisconsin Lutheran College in Milwaukee, small liberal arts school, wonderful. Place. I love love my faculty, love what mm -hmm. I learned. One thing that that really I, I made me think after watching those um, in theory four, one of the big things um, before we got to I'll call it post tonal theory, theory mm -hmm. just for the most simplest term I can come up with, was um, the different augmented six chords. Right. So French augmented mm -hmm. six chords, mm -hmm. Italian augmented, uh, you know, six chords. Right. That's all well and good. But as I think <laughs> back about that, 
you know, the, something with that level of specificity, mm-hmm. I wonder if that would be better handled in a graduate seminar. And instead, we round out the undergraduate curriculum with tritone substitutions. Sure. Or, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, something that builds upon what's already been learned about triads and scales, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera but applies it in something that's used more common today mm-hmm. right. compared to a French augmented uh, six chord. No, no offense to French augmented <laughs> yeah, six yeah, chords. No, they're no, they're lovely it. for what they are. Right. Um, <laughs> Esoteric, maybe. Yes, yes. Um, and especially, like, you know, figured bass. Again, and that's, yep. that's I, I, and I'm not going to have, by no means do I have all the answers. And that's why from an institution to institution basis, mm-hmm. this is where you got to go. Right. But... Should we spend time in a music theory classroom talking about figured bass or mm-hmm. how to play from lead sheet? Right. And again, there's there's different goals, different outcomes, different applications. I mean, geeking out on all those things, you're still going to learn a ton. Right. And you're going to... F- you're going to have great new ways to think about music that mm-hmm. you can explore in a bajillion different ways. Yep. Yeah, I mean, but. I think there's a there's a real issue of, of canon happening. Um, yeah. There, there's... It's difficult because if if you're an institution that specializes in in jazz, that's going to yeah. be your focus. And yes, so yes, obviously yes, yes. you're not going to then probably specialize in avant-garde electronic music or something yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um and so there there's a sense that anytime you focus, you're going to be exclusionary. Um, yes, yeah. But at the same time, the the issues that Adam Neely brings up about Schenker and things like that, about this this idea of asserting the supremacy of German music or something like that, I think is a real issue with Schenker. And uh, and and his point, I I, I love how he's he's kind of cheeky about it that that all good music can be reduced to three blind mice or something is <laughs> is pretty silly. Yes. But at the same time, a reductionist model of analysis isn't necessarily a bad thing and is almost uh, necessary in a way. Yeah. Can I launch on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I, by no means do I consider myself like a Shankarian. I mm-hmm. took um, a semester <laughs> of it at UW Madison. Right. Um, and in my, my, my master's program, Truman State University, uh, again, wonderful. If you're looking for a mm-hmm. mid-sized institution, um, Truman State, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Cool. Uh, but Where is Truman State? It, it is in Kirksville, Missouri. Oh, okay, So cool. it's... Um, it's a small t- small town, about fourteen thousand people, and Kirksville is the biggest thing going town wise for like the next hour and a half <laughs> nice. any direction. It, it's the spot. Um, yes, but it, what it, for me it was. Um, I, I will get to answer your question, just but I, I do like my I do love me some tangents. Yeah, um, no, no, but um, you know, if you're looking for a great place to study and just you have this wonderful, cute little community. But you can also just be super engaged mm-hmm. in your studies. Man, Kirksville is awesome. And it's great. Be, you know, like so many college towns, uh, right. you know, there's so much that the college offers to the mm-hmm. community that, you know, people can take part of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. It's, it's good stuff. But what I love about Shank, my, my Shankarian studies was it really helped me think long-term planning mm-hmm. in a piece of music. Um, what I loved in um, sh- my my, uh, my Shanker class at UW Madison was reducing music, and I'm I'm going to be a little rusty. So again, my terminology may not be perfect, but condensing music to like note to note note against note counterpoint. And mm, I'm actually yep. going to sh- going to share my 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 screen oh, nice. of um. Cool. Oh, actually, may I? Um, it looks like I need your permission to share. Oh the screen, yes, 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 yes. So here, while I'm doing this, do you want yeah. for anybody who doesn't know, do you want to explain yeah. a little bit about what Schenk- Schenkerian analysis is? Yeah. So the, uh, and again, I'm so rusty on my my, my German terminology. Okay. <laughs> Me too. But but the idea is that there's like a a fundamental melody, if you will, mm-hmm. and a fundamental baseline, right. um, all derived from the harmonic series, right? Um, in 
in Western classical music. Mm -hmm. That fundamental bass line um, can be essentially reduced to like a one five one right. or a tonic dominant right. uh, tonic, mm -hmm. which I think regardless of what sort of music you're listening to, I think can be a healthy way to think about in any kind of music, my home, yep. my departure and our arrival back home. Mm -hmm. I um, and then in it, on top of that, there's this fundamental melody or, or descent where so many melodies over the course of this whole piece of music mm -hmm. can kind of outline um, a descent from either the third degree scale, so the mm -hmm. three blind mice, if you will, <laughs> or the um, five, yeah. um, uh, you know, so fa mi re do, mm -hmm. or the whole octave eight seven six five four three two one, yeah. and that that manifest manifests itself in in the music. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have like layers upon layers of this, almost like, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself with 20 year old movie references, but the matrix, you could have like a matrix within the matrix. Right, right. <laughs> you can have these fundamental <laughs> structures yep. happening, um, locally. You can have, um, like mm -hmm. a mid range, um, scope of it, but then also these simple ideas can, you know, embody like 10 minutes worth of music. Oh yeah. Yeah. I th I think the especially the baseline the the tonic dominant tonic one five one yeah. or whatever I think there's a there's a powerful understanding in there not necessarily in C G C or any specific notes but just in the idea of ebb and flow or tension and release yes and and it 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 it, it mirrors a lot of wave functions in the physics of nature that's I mean that's how a speaker works that's how yeah. a string vibrates. Up yeah. to one, down to negative one, and then at at uh, at rest at zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the very least, it's another way to, to think about music and broaden the horizons. Yeah. So I think that's a great way. Um, so just to kind of, I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, can you see what I have here? Uh, yes. So when when I first le was learning about um, a shanker, the the primary goal was let's find the one five one and uh -huh. let's find it in the bass and let's find in the melody is it a, a three two one is it a five uh -huh. four three two one right right um, what I loved about um, my shanker studies with Brian Heyer was I mean yes that's very prevalent mm -hmm. but it's also let's let's take this music and think about how we can conceive about it in like species counterpoint. Right. Right. Um, right. and again, here's where, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little rusty. I think Schechter is one of the big, um, uh, textbook. Yeah. Schechter, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one of, one of the big, um, uh, texts in, mm -hmm. in, um, in Shank Shankarian studies. And, you know, we're, we're looking for these structures, but one of the points that's also made is, you know, so Gratis Art Parnatum, this, mm -hmm. you know, music text that looks at the music of Palestrina, the yep. idea was that you could take something simple, these two voices, and expand it into something massive. Mm -hmm. So just to talk a little bit about, about a piece I was writing for String Quartet. Is that, is um, that what's on the screen now? Yes, okay, exactly. Okay, so for anyone just listening, we, we're, we're looking at a piece for String Quartet and then piano also? Well, um, or that's the reduction. Yes, ah, exactly. I yes, see. yes. So, as a composer, I'm something that I'm really comfortable and good at, good at is coming up with little ideas, mm -hmm. and then I'm really good at getting stuck and figuring out what to do with those <laughs> little ideas. So, I use this idea of, you know, having these two voices of how do they parallel a fleshed out piece of music. Mm -hmm. So, I had the two big things that came to me. I'm just going to try to sing it. If I look at that uh, first uh, two measures of the cello line, I have the boom, 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 boom. That's something that I, I was cool. loving. I was liking how that was coming yep. along. Um, and then I had just this, uh, just that first measure of the violin. Bum, 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 ba, da, ba, 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 bum. That's as far as I got. Like, uh -huh. well, now I'm stuck. <laughs> and so I, I, I started thinking about... You know, in most of my music, there's some sort of identifiable chord that can be thought of, of in some sort of analysis. Like, oh, that's a C major, or that's a right. G flat 
major nine sharp 11 yep. or something <laughs> it's everything so you know yeah yeah yeah. so i have my my, my base of okay f g d mm-hmm. bay flat and then i just started thinking about what's a cool what, what's what what is the melodic arch that i want this piece to have mm-hmm. so i had if i had that first measure i figured well i can reduce this to an a and a b flat but what if the melody kind of went to f and then g and then Mm -hmm. oh yeah f c b flat that'll be cool and that just kind of became the melodic arc that i wanted of that section Mm. and i just you know, had a, a bass line uh, accompanying that. And that gave me some direction of where I wanted my chord progressions to go. Um, that mm-hmm. gave me shape. As you can see, like if we look at um, uh, the second measure on this piece of paper, if we compare violin one with um, the, the piano, mm-hmm. yes, that violin one, it has an A, A, C, and then an F. Like, it's not like the F is the most prominent note, but I knew like, well, I'm going to get there and we'll yep. see how I get there. But at least, you know, it gave me a game plan as right. opposed to just kind of sit in there like, well, now what do I do with my cool little melody? <laughs> So that it's 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 interesting the your in your process the shift between um sort of the more free flowing ideas uh yes almost improvisatory you're coming up with it and then you you take stock of the materials and then you're you're in more um um sort of thoughtful land and then back and then using that to launch you back into the free flowing yes that's very and cool. for me, that is probably here. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. That to <laughs> sums up, I would say piece to piece, my compositional pro, uh, process. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll start with something, and again, you know, give me like a couple seconds of the piano or a guitar, and I can come up with some cool little riff or ditty. But it's like, well, right. what do I do with this now? <laughs> and so it's this kind of ebb and flow. Okay, here's my idea. Mm-hmm. Let's expand this. Okay, so now I have this, and now like, what's the the form of the piece going to look right. like? What sort of keys do I want to venture in? And then as I'm going through, there'll be this revision, and then I'll have you know my my hundred measures or whatever. But then I'll be listening through. It's like, oh, I don't like that. And then I'll go back to the improvisatory and kind of mm-hmm. clean things up, or. Um, um, you know, I'll, I'll go voice by voice and just kind of play through each line and right. just be like, okay, this is all cool. And now I, here's this part. I didn't like what I came up with. And now by playing line by line, great. Now the cello has something better to do in measure 50. <laughs> and then, and what about rhythm? Cause this is all very pitch and har- harmony focused, but the rhythm yes. in, in that, in that piece for anybody who didn't see it, it was, it was, you know, syncopated 16th notes, tying over the bar, things like that. Um, and tying over the beat. So do you have a process or is that also more of a, a by feel kind of uh, writing? I would say it's by feel. I, I'm really experienced mm-hmm. with um, explaining systematically how I organize pitch right. in a composition. Mm-hmm. That's Rhythm, all of us. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rhythm, it's, I, for the most part, um, like that just comes pretty naturally. I mean, I can I can discuss, you know, as I look at um, the first and the third measures um, in the violin one, they both begin uh, with um, an eighth note rest, and then we have sixteenth notes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I can talk about recurring mo- rhythmic motives that yep. are in my music. Mm-hmm. It just comes so naturally to me right that um but as i'm going through you know so i'll look at those last um the very last beat i have four 16th notes as the piece progresses that 16th mo- note motive turns into something bigger and we'll right. just kind of get this chain of them that happens so like i i guess i try to be conscious of rhythmic motives in my music but I, it, it takes less work for me to be happy with how it turned out <laughs> compared to sure. how I'm working with form. And, and I, I think to the own music that I, I grew up listening to. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I, so I picked up the instrument because of Metallica, uh, the instrument being nice. guitar. Um, and Great. then, and then that's what opened doors to, um, 
studying music in college was like, boy, I really like, I started taking guitar lessons. Like mm -hmm. I remember learning about how, how a sus chord works and how I can take <laughs> my, my D, my D major chord. And if I play on the first string, the third fret instead of the second fret, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I have this D sus four and learning yeah. about how I'm replacing the third degree with the fourth of the scale. Like, and you got my mind to heaven right there. Yeah, exactly. It's like I want to learn how. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, and no, no, I want to learn. I ended up in a music theory classroom, and and things just just clicked. But mm -hmm. from that, I opened doors to um, listening to Dream Theater, which mm. will use any like time signature imaginable. Oh yeah. And then I think about um, um, playing funk music. Mm. So there was just I don't know what it was or how I got into it, but just, I think playing with the jazz band um, in college, just realizing, you know what? My favorite pieces that we do are, are the funk pieces. Yeah. And I mean, just the, the syncopation and rhythmically. Um, I mean, look at your rhythm here in this. I mean, that, that cello line is, is very funky. It, it almost reminds me of a clave. Yeah. With the groups of threes and twos. Yep. And mm -hmm. fours. Yeah. For yeah. And that's just something that, um, and those group groups of, of threes and twos, um, even in like I, I think like a Metallica's Master right. of Puppets, uh, ba -da -ba -da -da -ba -da -da -ba da ba da 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 We have all these different groupings of threes and twos that are very clave esque. Mm -hmm. All right, so that brings up another question for me with, yes. with with Metallica versus the the very DMA, the very you know notes dots on paper, very thoughtful yeah. about mm -hmm. uh, harmony versus. Where, where I see music like Metallica coming from, not that it doesn't have thought in it, but it's a completely different process. And the idea of it, that, that aggression and the, the feeling of it, um, do, you, do you try and bring that into your music? Because I see Metallica as very unrestrained music, and I see a lot of, um, quote, academic music or something like that as being s extremely restrained in a weird way. Yeah, I'm gonna play devil's advocate. Uh huh. Go for it. Um, but the it. first things I'm reminded of are um, composers like George Crumb and Black uh -huh. Angels. Sure. Um, there's a brilliant composer, um, Nick Amicioli. He did his grad studies at um, University of Missouri, Kansas City. I, I think is now in in the Madison area. But um, cool. writes just again one of the best new music composers out there. Mm. Check out his work. But I mean, powerful. Gritty, gritty uh, stuff. What's his name? Uh, Nick Amicioli. Nick Amicioli. I will, um, I will um, send a, cool. a follow up with links, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he used to run um, uh, the like the new music ensemble at um, mm -hmm. UMKC, uh, and when uh, I, I was at Truman State, being in Northern Missouri, we weren't too far, so we'd be at a lot. We'd end up at a lot of the same regional like new music festivals mm -hmm. um so i but, but 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 back to your question again th thanks for letting me go on my tangents upon tangents no and, i love um, it yes 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 and just to kind of preview i have a bit of a tangent upon tangent that's going to bring nice. a lot of what we've talked about together um so i would well and even just to play a, like I, uh -huh. I i totally get what you're saying I think it's more on academic. the audience side, by the way, less on the music oh, side. Oh, yes. No, that, yes. It's the culture of the performance itself, not necessarily the music or where Yes, it's no, thank you. And, and, and that's just... You know, and, 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 and I think that's just... The, at a new music concert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think it's just the perception of art music, classical right. music, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, that, um, you know, Beethoven writes gritty, pounding oh, yeah. music, oh, but yeah. there's this perception that classical music is something of the the elite. Mm -hmm. And part of that just can go back to, you know, long times of, you know, the courts of the Baroque, right. you know, rulers, and, you know, here, <laughs> here I have my court composer, and mm -hmm. Me and my peeps, who are all yep. bajillionaires, we're the only ones who get to partake of, of this new Telemann. I mean, again, Telemann's right. not the best example because he was widely pub published, but right. you get the example, like the, the, the that the, that we own this and this is right. music for the privileged. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, I mean, yes, um, you know, during the classical period and beyond, that's you know, access to that music has continued. 
but that perception still definitely is there. And Mm -hmm. in addition to that, I'm reminded of um, the perception of music being for the academics. Um, Part of that is because academia has become a supporter or a home of mm-hmm. where new musicians can oh, yeah. like survive mm-hmm. and actually have a chance to share what they have. It also goes back to, um, you know, to, to Milton Babbitt's idea that right. music is like, this is a science and we need like scholars who are digging into the oh, academic yeah. trenches and seeing what sort of great academic things we can come up with. And which is awesome, which yeah. is great, oh, which Babbitt, is phenomenal. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think, those mentalities are one of the reasons that for your your average listener, mm-hmm. um, classical music can be stuffy or right. whatever. I'm also reminded of the Bartok string quartets, which mm-hmm. sound, can get pretty metal at times, too. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I, yeah. Definitely. But that that's yeah. it. Like, they're digging in. And not, not that it's it would exactly... Uh, induce a mosh pit i feel like there's there's a little bit of a volume issue and there's a state there's there's a whole culture and a staging issue but there is something that when the musicians are on stage just like digging into their instruments and playing their hearts out and there's people sitting there you know like when are we gonna go get a drink yeah yeah (laughs) yeah and and i don't have the answer to that um something that helps in madison um like the I, I'm I'm going to get the name wrong, so apologies uh-huh. on that. But make music everywhere. I oh, believe yeah. is oh, yeah. the I idea. Oh yeah, did that so, yesterday with, in well, L.A. Yeah, make music well, yeah. LA. It's, yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the idea of like let's let's show like the world that like this can we can hear this at a coffee spot mm-hmm. or a bar or yep. a street corner or wherever wherever ever. Mm-hmm. We don't have to go to the downtown of the big metropolitan right. um, area mm-hmm. in the concert hall that costs millions of dollars to make etc cetera, etc cetera, or we don't have to go to the university um etc right. etc et it you know new music can happen anywhere yeah um which will kind of bring me to uh I, I, again i'm gonna kind of go on uh uh-huh. on, on some tangents please i'm gonna talk uh thanks for thanks for letting me just kind of do this just to kind of bring back something something that's been very much on my mind mm-hmm. that ties in metal uh-huh. That ties in um, the canon, and you know what's being being included. Mm-hmm. Um, so, do you do you listen to a lot of heavy metal? Yes. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the band Dream Theater? Yes. Are you familiar with the band Nightwish? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, <laughs> two of my biggest. Um, so, so going back onto Metallica, I love them all through high school, mm-hmm. and then I was waiting for years for Saint Anger to come out. Right. And it was a disappointing album, mm. and at, at, le- at least to me, it I, was. Yeah. No, uh, no, no. I, at, I think to a lot at, of people, the, honestly. Yes, yes. At that point, like, well, I guess I need to discover new bands if I want right. to, like, to have a favorite band that's to do music. So then that got me into Dream Theater, um, mm. which, again, any time signature imaginable, and um, again, we have these powerful melodies that are soaring above these complex rhythmic textures. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of got me into the band Nightwish, um, which, you know, similar. We have these powerful melodies. Mm-hmm. We have these cool rhythmic things. Nightwish focuses more on the virtuosity right. of their instrumentalists. Mm-hmm. Um, Nightwish incorporates more choral instrumental right. sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, musically, these are two groups that are very, very, very similar. Um, but there's one key difference um, about them. Nightwish has has a female lead singer. Mm. Um, and when I saw Nightwish, so when I've gone to metal concerts, these mm-hmm. are generally all male groups. Um, it's predominantly all males in attendance. Mm. Um, but when I saw, saw Nightwish in concert... Um, it was a, the, the gender mix was very, very even. You, you mean the audience was more mixed? Yes. Mm, okay. Yes. Um, and so something that I've been just kind of aware of is, uh, you know, just kind of think about that, like, you know, musically, again, these, these are similar groups, but right. by, by women seeing, you know, someone who, who looked like them in the spotlight, mm. all of a sudden there was more of a, uh, of a, of a connection sure. and more, there's that something sense. that resonates. And then there was just more, more interest. So mm-hmm. how, how I think this back to, uh, as, as an educator, mm-hmm. um, so we, we work, or I, I work in the world of, of music, uh, composition, um, mm-hmm. uh, 
Oh, earlier this year, I had a chance to be like a, a guest composer. I was leading a master class for a local high school. Nice. And you know, so much of co composition pedagogy is, um, boy, this is really cool. Have you heard, checked out this composer's music? Mm -hmm. Boy, this is really great. Have you checked out this composer's music? Right. So this class, it is predominantly boys and girls. Um, like, uh, you know, I, like it is an even, even mm, mix. I see. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're getting where I'm going with this. But in the classical canon... Yep. Um, from antiquity through going into mm -hmm. like the 20th century, mm -hmm. there are only, you know, in, I can only think of two women composers who you find in just about every, every music text. Mm -hmm. Hildegard of Bingen of the 12th century, mm -hmm. Clara Wieck Schumann of mm -hmm. the 19th century. I mean, yes, Fanny some Mendelsohn, text, maybe. Yeah, F Fanny Mendelssohn will will come up. Um, Amy Beach will come up. Right. Um, Joan Tower will come up, but again, that's 1983. And again, uh, with, oh yeah, yeah, with, yeah. And, 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 and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, Joan Tower will come up. I'm thinking of Ellen's Vit. I'm going to yes, mess up. Yes, yes, yes. Tafel yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First woman to win the Pulitzer Prize in music right. in 1983. But you know, as I'm going through this. Um, and, and and giving these, these students classes or you know giving examples just the realization so much of the the canon mm -hmm. are men and it's just true. be like so we're mm -hmm. going through and yes i'm talking about such and such and goes but i also like my you know just making it using my role as an educator mm -hmm. to be intentional about like yes that george crumb piece is awesome also, check out this Jennifer Higdon piece. Right. I think you're going to oh, get yeah. a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, this Mezion piece is amazing. Have you listened to Chen Yi? Right. Boy, yes, mm -hmm. by all means, Brahms, yes, check out Brahms's music. Yes, that's all great. <laughs> also, UW Madison professor Laura Schwendinger. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think just kind of tying in canon, and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just remember making that connection with, you know, here's heavy metal of all things. Right. Just by broadening the diversity mm -hmm. of the performers by putting one music of one one um, woman on that stage, all of a sudden we have so much more more appeal. It's just so much easier to make those those connections. Right. Um, and I just mean, especially as, as a I, rock band because because a big part of the appeal is you know you're, you're you're seeing this figure on stage. Maybe you're imagining that you're up yeah. there, and so you're, yeah. you're you're seeing yourself in it. I think I think it makes a lot of sense with the representation in curriculum for sure. Yeah, it was something that. Um, did you ever take a class with uh, uh, Larry Arp at, I did at not. UW? So I, I took his. Um, it was a, a graduate seminar on the history of notation. Yeah. Uh, but he he made a, a strong point to point out that even though in in the basic textbooks about uh, medieval music, thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth century. There aren't really lots of women included. There were tons of women working in music. And so we had all these readings about like Eleanor of Aquitaine, the Contest of Dia and stuff. And, yeah. uh, but just, uh, just pointing out that there are often people working in these fields and we just don't know about it because this yes. textbook is so focused in a certain area and is uh, sort of ignoring all of these other things. And there's, there's a vibrant and diverse scene happening. Yeah, that gets that gets sort of erased by how we write about history. Yeah, absolutely. And again, so my one of the hats I wear is I teach again, again an online um, appreciation history music course. Mm -hmm. And when we last looked at the course, um, you know, we definitely wanted strove to you know include a diverse examples, mm -hmm. but. You know, there's progress to be made and yep. whatever, you know, as an educator, whatever I can do so that any student of any background sees themselves reflected somehow. Yep. I mean, that's that's powerful, powerful oh, stuff. Yeah. And whatever whatever we can do to showcase that, you know, I mean, yes, we're two white males, but recognizing that like white males aren't the be all end all of the music <laughs> world like there's. Right. The world would be a much worse place if that were, because there are phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal composers of all, Everybody's of all backgrounds, yeah, right. genders, etc. There's music yeah. everywhere. Everybody yep. makes music. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for letting me kind of go on that <laughs> spiel to kind of tie, tie in metal and uh -huh. the canon and classical music, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah. so what, what is the, the, the class you were just talking about? It was an appreciation course? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I teach. It's with um, the independent learning program. Again, just a quick advertisement for anyone who's looking for a, a general degree requirement mm -hmm. um, that you can you can enroll in the independent learning program with with uh, University of Wisconsin. You can enroll at any time. You have um, six to twelve months. Um, you know, students' choice to complete the course at your own pace. Cool. Um, so again, just I, I just love we're we're accommodating students, um, mm -hmm. you know, from, from that timetable, like we're just to be in a situation. And as a grader, it doesn't mean that I have a stack this high <laughs> of unit seven that yeah, I have to yeah. go through and just read 30 essays in a row on WC. I love WC, right. but what I, but again, what I love about the course is, you know, someone with the, from unit two on the middle ages and the Renaissance, right. so their paper comes in the next week. Um, um, you know, something about, oh, well, you know, so, so to geek out a little bit uh -huh. about something I'm it. very proud of with, with this course when we revised it. The previous um, course, um, we get to the 20th century. Let's all talk about all the diversity of sounds of the 20th century. Right, right. And like, okay, so we also have world music. Mm. Um, and like, here's two examples. Sure. And just as like, as an educator, like, wait, we're condensing, you know, the entirety right. of non-Western <laughs> music to this yeah. one section in mm -hmm. the text with these two right, examples right. either do it or you know either I mean, it's include better it. not to almost yeah. yeah yeah either include it right or don't right and so when i revised the course um we have a whole unit mm -hmm. um of just non-westerns music and again mm -hmm. You know whether or not that's sufficient, etc. You know that's these are all great things to discuss. But the point is, we are making it its own thing right. that gets just as much um, discussion as the Baroque period, just mm -hmm. as much discussion as the classical period, and. Um, what what I love is I, I earlier in the course I give students the um, kind of some research chops to uh, discover mm -hmm. you know music on their own, and so we get to unit eight and you know music out the world, you know yes we we cover a lot of examples from different regions of the world. It's like okay you got a sample, like you for like the rest of this unit you are exploring about the culture or the mm -hmm. region of your choice. Cool. And I'm not going to tell you what that has to be. You, it's it's entirely. <laughs> up to you mm -hmm. and um again just from a grading perspective like right. just the variety of the stuff that i get to get to read about um i just just love it just absolutely love it mm -hmm. cool. so and again the because just talk a little bit about the program because students can enroll at any time um once we set up a version of the course it kind of like that iteration of the course lasts for for a few years until we're ready to to revise just again because like I can't just like swap the stuff mid course because like <laughs> right, right. like wait a second why didn't I get to do that in unit mm -hmm. two um, like this you know it's still you know, just academic yeah. stuff policy etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but I, I do know going forward um, you know that that's the sort of stuff I want to like the next time we revise I want to keep on mm -hmm. you know furthering even more of right. like yes you know Beethoven and Brahms are great. But there's a lot of other great stuff out there, <laughs> yeah. and um, you know, see see what students are excited about exploring. Yeah, it's it's an interesting challenge as an educator, though, because you have to become knowledgeable about such a broad range of things. I, I mean, if if you're going to be able to teach it well, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. No, that is that is absolutely true, and I I. I, I've just loved geeking out mm -hmm. on just such a wide variety of music. By, by no means am I like a scholar on all of these sorts of things. Right. But something that also makes my job a little bit easier is it's not like part of a core curriculum. Mm -hmm. Like there isn't appreciation history of music too. Right. Um, like a, <laughs> so that kind of gives me a little bit more freedom as to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to make sure that. I mean, yes, they they you know they they watch an opera. I, I think cool. that's a good and healthy thing to do. They, uh -huh. they get to pick it. You know, I give them lots of <laughs> options for the romantic period. Yeah. But, you know, they broaden horizons that. But, um, and, and I think it's, again, with, with musics from all around the world, um, you know, definitely, yes, I make sure that I'm proficient with the examples mm -hmm. that we're talking about. But also making sure that they're proficient at the research shops. Right. And um, give, them, give them those opportunities yeah. to explore. That's great. Yeah. 
So, so what about you? What about creative work now? Do you have anything going? Do you project? Yeah. So, um, uh, that um, string quartet that I showed you, I'll be uh -huh. working on reaching out to some some ensembles just oh, to kind of see if we can get a performance of it. Um, my next, my latest commission slash next performance, and again, like like everybody, COVID mm -hmm. threw things for a right. loop. So I think we're looking at March 2022. There's a wonderful piano and oboe duo called the Clara Schumann Project. Oh, okay. um, it's um, nice. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll I'll send links to their That's stuff. Great. Uh, but cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they commissioned me to um, write uh, a piece for them. That again, I think in March they're going to do. So mm -hmm. they're we we the the two musicians and I we share a church music interest. Mm -hmm. So they'll be um, well, and they they all wear a bajillion hats because they're insanely talented. <laughs> but. Um, they're looking to uh, put together some like a like a Passion Week um, mm. recital program, cool. and so just to dive a little bit into the church music world. Mm -hmm. So there's the week leading before Easter, where we have kind of pivotal things that are happening in in the Christian religion: a uh, Palm Sunday, mm, a Monday right. or Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, different dates. Um, and so they thought it was like, well, let's have a piece of music for each of these key po uh, components of that Passion Week or that Holy Week. Right. So I wrote a piece for um, uh, Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday. Um, just to talk about the the, the Christian religion, that's mm -hmm. when um, uh, communion uh, first begins, ah, and then there's also okay. some powerful accounts of uh, of Jesus uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before mm. he's about to be arrested and tried and killed, and it's just lots of musically, um, mm -hmm. just some some great moments for musical reflection and meditation mm -hmm. to to paint paint these scenes. Cool. That, yeah, that that's great. So uh, you you compose for that? Are you composing for the whole week? Oh, no, uh, um, no, just just for uh, just for that Holy Thursday, that oh, Monday okay. Thursday. I see. Okay. Yep. Cool. And so the the idea was they found something. You know, there, there's tons of Good Friday music. There's tons of uh -huh. Easter Sunday music. I see. Um, but that, <laughs> that yes, but that Monday Thursday, like, boy, here's kind of like this key, you know, this key date in this religious right. festival. We're having trouble finding mm. um, something to fit. So like, hey, we like rich. He writes, he writes, you know, we've, we've built rapport. He, he could write something for us. And cool. so, yeah. What, so what's, what's the ensemble? What's the piece? Like? Um, it's for um, oboe and piano. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, it's called The Hour is at Hand. And uh, yeah, yes. that's the, uh, the, the, the duo that's uh, performing. It's a piano and then um, oboe and then English horn in the mix. But uh, as far as the, the performing ensemble, oh, cool. that's putting uh, these recitals two together. Two players or one player? Yep, switching. two players. Yeah. Or I'm Great. sorry, one player who switches between oboe okay. and English horn. Yep. English horn, the best instrument ever. <laughs> oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then beyond that, um, I've just loved in recent years exploring the world of digital audio workstations. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> And so just finding like any opportunity to write some sort of like background music. Right. I mean, yes, you know, it's, it's background music. It's not necessarily art music, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a, f it's a blast. Right. So um, I, I gave a recent uh, conference presentation um, related to online pedagogy mm -hmm. and it was um, uh, presentations given, you know, just people made their own YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know what? I'm going to make like really cool, like little intro music and, um, you know, video games have shaped my aesthetic. So mm -hmm. like, Hey, here's like a pixelated rich phrase. And here's this <laughs> eight bit sounding video game music just Great. to kind of introduce the video. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to my, my church music background, I'm working on, um, a series of uh, history videos about, uh, campus ministry in Madison. Mm. And so might as well give these videos, you know, mm -hmm. soundtrack. Because, yep. like, why not? Right. Uh, kind of the most, one of my more ambitious things uh, that I've used as an excuse to write music. Mm -hmm. So I was working with, um, again, with uh, the independent learning program with UW. Um, someone suggested, uh, we, we were just kind of putting together, like, some history. Because it's a program that goes back to the 1800s. I mean, it is. Oh, wow. It has a rich, pro, um, rich history. And one of my colleagues suggested, like, boy, Rich, what if you, like, wrote a soundtrack for independent learning? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be grand? And then, like, the gears started going. Because we had started putting together, like, historical booklets. Mm -hmm. So, like, I could, like 
make a hist like a video that goes over like the history of independent learning and i could use that as an excuse so here was this idea like rich like how about you write some music mm -hmm. and for that i just wrote with like so i'm gonna do all these hours of making this <laughs> video project of history yeah and then i'll get to the easy part of uh right, you just... know getting getting the background music <laughs> But it, it's a cool process. I, I I like film and video game scoring and and yeah. and, and writing for media for yes. that reason because the the role of music changes and it's an interesting challenge when mm -hmm. it, it it really has very little to do with working things out in terms of harmonic progressions and while those can be useful, that isn't yes. the purpose. The purpose is to serve uh, uh, a a bigger collaboration or something, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and again, like I love just kind of thinking about like crunchy harmonies yeah. and my my map of where hard the part the piece will harmonically go. Mm -hmm. But with something like you know film music or whatever, it's like okay, so like this needs to be an hour thirteen or sorry like right. one minute thirteen seconds. <laughs> like that's that's the big thing. Right. Whatever fancy chords you throw in there are great, but at the yep. end of the day, like did you get this so that like it functions? Yep. So that you like music is starting here, mm -hmm. it ends here, and in that very precise seventy three seconds, mm -hmm. did you did you find something that fits the text or, yep. you know, that, that matches with what, what it accompanies? Yeah. I've, I've been seeing these, these ads on YouTube on the mm -hmm. YouTube app on my phone that are four seconds long Yeah, and it's, and they're packed and you know exactly what they're selling. I mean, honestly, in terms of the craft, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I'm reminded of, um, back when I was taking guitar lessons, this is, Oh my gosh, like 15 years ago now. <laughs> you know, like the, the older we get, the longer it was that we learn things. And I had uh, one of my big mentors in music, Matt Miller. He's a Milwaukee-based mm. guitarist and bass player and trumpet player. And he was telling me about the art of the 30 seconds because he mm. was um, he did a lot of um, like radio jingle work on the side. Ah, cool. And I just remember at the time thinking like, wow, like condensing an idea into like 30 seconds. But just in those 15 years, how media has changed. And again, here's this quick YouTube ad that's four seconds long. And how do we condense all of this <laughs> into this? And, yep. and effectively. Mm -hmm. And again, they're playing like, oh, looks like a kind of cool product. Maybe I'll check it out. Or even like, <laughs> well, that was, that was a really cool four seconds of music. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like Schoenberg has the, the those piano pieces that some of them are 15, 20 seconds long. It's it's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. just, that's all you need. He said it. He did it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and which also reminds me of the the calls for scores that you'll kind of uh, find of uh, miniature uh, pieces. Oh, yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, one of my large ensemble pieces uh, that I did uh, while at grad school. It's only seven seconds long because like that's like there's like okay we're gonna do here's here's the group we did we have our call call for scores for seven seconds of music i remember <laughs> registering amazing. that with bmi um nice. and uh you know they said the duration like so uh like we, we work by the minute so if you're gonna get any royalty from us like your piece has to be at least 30 seconds so that we can round to the dearest minute like sorry what if, what if you don't they get play your it three or four times in a row there, yeah, there yeah, you right. go. <laughs> so like, yeah, sorry, Rich, no, no BMI royalty, buddy, for uh -huh. your performance of that. Uh, it's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, do you want to play a little bit? Let's play a little cool. bit. Cool. Yeah. Got a got banjo here. I've been I've been kind of like falling in love with this instrument lately. I've been playing it a lot the last couple of years. But... How long have you been playing banjo? Uh, well, I've had one for a long time, but um, I got called to play Steve Martin's musical, Bright Star, which is okay. all, um, it's all bluegrass banjo music. And it was, yeah. it was a, a two-week call, and they, they needed somebody. And I was, like, I, I was like, I should say no. I actually don't know how to do this. And then I said, just say yes and learn it. And then it was just two weeks of hell, just practicing all day, every day, so I could play this gig. But... <laughs> That's but awesome. I figured it out, and I really liked. I really liked it, and I love like the claw hammer. Yeah. Or I um, kind of that you know, learn something for a gig. I had a had a, a guitar student who was interested in picking up banjo. Mm. I never played. I was like, well, I can stay. <laughs> I can stay two weeks ahead of the student. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and I did, and it was nice. fine. But um, just the whole concept as, as a as a guitar player, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm used to my 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 pitches, you know, going low strings to high strings. Oh yeah. Yeah. The drone really. 
Mess yeah, this and like, up. what on earth do I do with this thing? Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, you do, you do your fills, and it sounds sounds all nice and wonderful. But that was for me the big hurdle that uh, if if I ever get back to the banjo, will be my. Uh, my, my thing to overcome of making making sense yep. and learning how to work with that that higher pitch string at the bottom of everything <laughs> well actually when i do jazz gigs that or, or like musicals like 42nd street and stuff yeah. kind of jazz based yeah. musicals i always take that string off because it gets in the oh. way if you're doing a lot of chromatic chord work yeah because it doesn't change pitch so if it's just on a g it's just annoying you know it's yeah annoying. yeah so just going a little bit of a tangent but it's a, a question so as as someone who's played guitar Mm-hmm. And someone who has an affinity for the banjo, what do you what made you think I want to learn how to play like the banjo as it really is, as opposed to like those guitar banjos? Right. right. Well, part of it was for the show. There was no option. Oh, okay. There was, the the show was written for real bluegrass banjo. There's even it's funny. There's an app for the banjo part for that show that tabs out all the all the parts because yeah. the way it's written is it's just with melodies and chords yeah like slashes slash notation with chords and stuff so you'd never know but there are very specific banjo licks throughout that whole show and so the original broadway player made an app where he tabbed everything out with videos to show you how it was it was the it was the best thing ever i don't think i could have done it without that app bless his heart and bravo to all those people in the world who make things easier (laughs) yeah Cool. So you you have a you have a, a vocal and keyboard rig going on today. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll kind of see what happens. Um, yeah. And just to get, get, go back to um, some of the church music stuff, um, you know, the pandemic hit and everything mm. was shut down. Um, thankfully, leading up to this, I had had some experience working with digital audio workstations. Mm. Mm-hmm. So like, okay, like I can. I can make like instrumental parts and I'll just have singers like record themselves and just email me their recordings. Right. And, um, you know, and I can just kind of sing along with, with my work, you know, if it works for zoom meetings, it'll work for this again, you know, by no means are these going to be like pristine Grammy award winning productions as far as, but you know, for, for the intents and purposes, like, Hey, we just needed some music or mm-hmm. for right now, you know, some improvisation among friends. Yeah. Works perfectly. Cool. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, do you want to try something out? Yeah. See what do you happens. Wanna start? Yeah, let's sure. see what happens. All right. I'll, I'll let you kind of start and then I'll work my way into that. All right, cool.
Cool. Well, that was fun. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Thanks for singing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah. When, I like when people sing. I, it, it's great to hear people's voices. I, uh, I, I, I sang a, a song on the, the show I did yesterday, and I, I don't really like singing, but the bass player I was playing with was saying that when people sing, you have to, you have, to have confidence in your voice because that is your voice, and it's okay if your voice isn't amazing. Yep. Because actually what people connect with is just your voice and giving into it and like let that be your instrument and strum it. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. yeah and thanks again, for singing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And when you, um, again, I love, love the chance to, to improvise. When you mention like, okay, so I do have a guitar. Like <laughs> I could find like some way mm-hmm. to like, you know, get this set up going. But like, but I've been using this like nice. the last 15 months. So I'll just give, give that a go. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, thank you. And again, it's um, I I don't consider myself um like a trained vocalist by anything, but just with, you know, church music mm-hmm. and um choral composition, it's just you know, great great outlets and ways that these things kind of grow. So and nice, that's nice banjo stuff too. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Got weird at the end, but. So as well it should. As well, yeah. imp- if, if improv isn't getting weird at, at least one point, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Cool. Well, so so what what's next for you? Is there is there anywhere that we can direct people to hear some of your music? Um. Yes, I have a uh, SoundCloud, uh, SoundCloud.com/slash rich dash phrasey. I'll uh, get links to that. Um, cool. Yeah. I'll beyond that, that, I'll put it all in the description so people can follow the links and find find your work. And Perfect. Then, uh, you're teaching coming up yep. soon. Yep. Yep. And Got then, um, yeah, kind of exciting things going on with, um, again, since March 2020, my, my, my full time job, my main job with um, UW Madison has been assisting faculty. So mm. um, we're excited. We're forming a new center of uh, teaching, learning, and mentoring. Um, just being able to geek out with faculty about pedagogy. Oh, and yeah. yeah. So it's. Um, Again, it's a, it's a, like a new thing, so mm-hmm. like we'll find out exactly what what uh, what that looks like. But um, you can always count on um, count on me if I'm giving like some video presentation or if you find like something mm-hmm. on YouTube. Like even if it's about pedagogy or something, odds are like I found some sort of snippet there the video <laughs> to like have some bombastic music intro or something nice. like that. Cool. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, beyond that. Um, you know, keep on finding those calls for scores and, mm-hmm. um, oh, yeah. you know, riding, riding as we can. And yep. I'll let you, I, I will let you know when um, we do have a confirmed uh, a world premiere date of the um, piano and oboe Great. piece. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we'll definitely... yeah. yeah, and as, as all musicians, it's just kind of coming out of COVID. It's like, wait, mm-hmm. like, how, how do we do this again? Like, how do we get back into the swing of things? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for touch, talking with me today, Anthony. Thank you so much. I always love the chance to uh, to geek out. Always, oh, yeah. always a pleasure. And always, great. and again, especially as uh, you know, UW Madison folk, always wonderful to find mm-hmm. a chance to connect. Yeah. Cool. Well, everybody, check out Dr. Rich Frazee and uh, talk to you later. Cool. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for watching or listening, depending on if you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast stream. Remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channels. And remember to check out Dr. Rich Frazee's links below. Check out his YouTube and his SoundCloud, and maybe enroll in one of his courses at UW-Madison. And if you would like to consider supporting this podcast and my content generally, please visit my Patreon page. (laughs) 